encouraged to be organised gay youth in England, 1970 to 1990. So, Clifford, are you there? Yes. I think you can see me and you can hear me, hopefully. Yes, we can. We can see and hear you, Clifford. Thank you very much. Take it away. Thank you. Well, as uh, Rico's just found, there's so much to cover. Um, <laughs> the time slots that we're given uh, are not really long enough to do justice to the topics that we're trying to cover. And um, very much like Rico, I'm going to uh, con have to condense an awful lot into a short time. But let me just share my screen. Now you should be able to see my first slide. Perhaps Lydia could just confirm that you can now see my, my first yes, slide. We can see your slide. Thank you, Clifford. Okay. Uh, and those people who wanted to make a cup of tea hopefully will come back soon so they don't miss part of this talk. But here we go. Uh, you might have heard of John Adams' piece of music called Short Ride in a Fast Machine. Well, this is going to be my fast ride in a short time over a big topic. It's a potted version of a very much bigger top piece of research that I've been doing over the last three or four years. I'm going to go back to 2017 because you will know that, many of you will know, that that marked the 50th anniversary of the partial decriminalisation of homosexual acts in England and Wales. And the BBC broadcast a number of programmes as part of Gay Britannia, including Growing Up Gay by Ollie Alexander and Against the Law with Daniel Maylies as Peter Wildblood. At the time, I, I was doing some research in the Hampshire archives and I saw a card in the room where you take your sandwiches and you have your tea during your break between doing your work in the search room. And this card said, did you grow up LGBT? in the 50s, 60s, 70s and 80s. I thought, yes, I did. Uh, OK, this group wanted to interview people like myself. So I got in touch with them, this local LGBT youth group who were doing their own LGBT history project, Heritage Lottery funded. I explained to them in an interview my journey. And because I, I'm involved in historical research, I was interested in helping them, so I actually went through the process of getting all the checks, CBRE or whatever you call it, and the uh, process of becoming a volunteer with their project and embarked on helping them to uncover some of the past. A lot of what I found in my own research and which I showed these young people was to do with the 1970s and 80s. And these are the two eras that I'm going to talk about mainly today, eras of great change that I witnessed So the language of the past was different in many respects from that of today. The terms used for LGBT plus people were invariably ones that may seem dated to younger people. This slide contains most of the common terms around in the 1970s and 80s. Terms shown in red were offensive and insulting. Thus, many older LGBT people like myself do not like the term queer and find it awkward hearing about queer history. Note also the terms transsexual and transvestite were in use, and the modern term transgender does not appear until the 1990s. It is difficult not to offend some people when discussing LGBT issues. So diverse is the nature of the different peoples that the category covers. A word of warning for those of you who are doing research, particularly if you're doing Google searches, word searches using the word gay, for example, you can come up with something like this, a gay youth centre, right back in 1962. But this was a gay youth centre in Nottinghamshire, which had nothing to do with homosexual or LGBT youth. It was just the use of the word gay at the time, or cheerful, merry. 1967 marked the partial decriminalisation, as I said, but for under 21 year olds, 
there was no such decriminalisation. Any sexual act between males where one or both parties were under 21 was a criminal offence. The report from the newspaper in 1968 concerns a case of four teenagers, teenage boys, all convicted for consenting sexual acts with one another. Two of them were sent to Borstal, which was a, like a juvenile prison, and sadly one of them committed suicide in detention. For young people like myself growing up at that time, it was a virtual desert as far as knowing about being gay was concerned. The only gay people we knew were stereotypically camp men on television, like Kenneth Williams, Dick Emery's characters, John Inman, or Larry Grayson with his catchphrase, shut that door. But there was a glimmer of light in David Bowie. He said he was bisexual. In researching this topic, gay youth, 1967 to 1990, I have spent many hours in wonderful archives and libraries. These three in particular, the Bishopsgate Institute, which we've already heard about, the London School of Economics, which holds the Paul Carpenter archives, and the magnificent British Library. And here you'll see me in the, one of their listening booths because they've got not only written documents, but a very good audio collection. Let's just go back 50 years to 1971. This marks the first known organised public event by young people to do with gay liberation. This is an event organised by the Gay Liberation Front Youth Group who protested against the age of consent on a march on the 28th of August 1971 that ended with a rally in Trafalgar Square. The late Tony Reynolds was a key organiser of this event. By the end of 1971, the GLF Youth Group had become the Youth and Education Group. They helped to put together editions of the GLF newspaper, Come Together, and in June 1972 they organised a dance in West London. That summer they organised the first Gay Pride Week in London. This remarkable group, which was for under 21s only, male and female, I should point out that the word gay at the time encompassed male and female. It wasn't, it wasn't just exclusively used for men. They had four demands, reduction and an eventual abolition of the age of consent, complete unbiased sex education in schools and adult education, that young homosexuals would not be subject to psychiatric aversion at school or work, and an end to discrimination for young homosexuals at work and in school. For the time, they were very radical. The GLF splintered and fractured by 1975. It was a short-lived but lively setup. They clearly kick-started more action from the older organisation, the Campaign for Homosexual Equality, this certainly has a longer history and lasted a lot longer, but they were a little bit more reserved and many people who joined them were in it for social reasons only. Its roots lay in the North Western Law Reform Committee that was begun in 1964. This was renamed the Committee for Homosexual Equality in 1969 and from April 1971, the campaign the most, it is the most significant gay rights lobbying group before Stonewall. At its second annual conference in Malvern in 1974, it backed a motion calling to campaign to lower the age of consent to 16. It also called to back an organisation called Parents Inquiry. This had been set up by Rose Robertson, a grandmother who wanted to give support to the parents of gay children and the gay teenagers themselves. She was a clear pioneer in this field. After this conference, CHE set up a Young Gays campaign, later called the Teenage Movement. And throughout 1975, they looked at how they could provide better provision for under 21 year olds. Many CHE groups would not allow under 21s. 
1976, they passed a motion at the Southampton Conference saying that all CHG groups should be open to young men and women under 21. A few of those young men were optimistic and set out for the conference in Southampton from Waterloo Station. Here we see them before the train departs. This is actually a train that was hired by the CHE. And shown in this picture, on the left we have Phil Cox, about him, a bit more about him shortly. Gary James, with his left arm being waved, who's recently published his autobiography. Paul Welsh, John Gill and Michael, possibly Michael Imber. But following the um, conference in Southampton, the London CHE Teenage Group, which Philip Cox and Paul Welsh had helped to establish, uh, fell out of uh, favour with the CHE hierarchy. And although they were meeting at a friend organisation, which still exists in Upper Street, and this picture on the top right shows the friend organisation today, and then at the Oval House by the famous cricket ground. Phil Cox decided they should split away from CHE and set up in new premises, which they managed to find in Holloway Road. So the London Gay Teenage Group became its own independent self in 1976, although it didn't go public, so to speak, in terms of an announcement in gay news until beginning of 1977 and it was announced that the first meeting would be held at 296 Holloway Road on February the 13th. They had actually met there a few times beforehand just to test the water. But who was Phil Cox? Philip Cox, born in 1956, who along with Paul Welsh ran the CHE teenage group and then set up the breakaway independent London Gay Teenage Group. Having established that, he then went on to become a volunteer at Gay Switchboard, and he was the youngest volunteer there. One of his main interests was pirate radio, and he broadcast on a station called Gay Waves. On the left, you can see Gay News listing the London Gay Teenage Group meetings, and also the Parents Inquiry Youth Group. Bill Cox handed over to people like Steve Power. Steve, who was the chair of the London Gay Teenage Group 1977 to 1980. Fortunately, Steve kept his paperwork and there's lots of it. He went on to train as a youth worker and helped to set up other gay youth support networks. In 2018 and 2019, we met up for the first time. It was about 40 years since we'd last seen each other. Steve brought all his paperwork along and I've spent many hours examining these papers. And some of the papers that Steve kept and other papers that people have found, photographs as well, as well, have helped paint a picture and helped me outline and trace and track the history of various gay youth organisations of the period. These are just some of the photographs which we've had great fun sharing with other people on social media, trying to name people, and also reflecting, sadly, where we've found out that people have passed on, often through AIDS or AIDS-related illnesses. So this is 296 Holloway Road, the door on the right, and the tube station on the left, and many a young person came out of that tube station and walked up that road. It's about a 10 minute walk to 296. Many did not have the balls to ring the bell and enter through that door. For those that did, it was often a life-changing experience. Pent-up frustration was unleashed. Suddenly one found oneself in a group of like-minded people. There were a vast array of people's backgrounds represented in that group. We were a very mixed bunch, ethnicity, class, religion. We came from all backgrounds and all types of background. We all had one thing in common, we had commonality in sexual orientation, men and women, predominantly men. 
here we have the premises today. It was actually on the uh, first floor that we met and there you can see the arrow pointing to that door. I have um, met a, a few people when I've given these talks in person who've come to me afterwards and said they, they went up and down that road. They went to that door. They couldn't they couldn't bring themselves to knock on the door or they did knock on the door and then they walked away before anybody answered it. And that's a great shame, but it took a lot of courage to to be out, if you like, or to go to places like this. Of course, a lot of people weren't out at home or at school. Couldn't be out at school for a start because you'd be sent to a psychiatrist. Here we have a photograph taken on the left um, of Holloway Road and two of the young people, older teenagers who were in the group in 1978. And on the right, you can see the same road seen today. The buildings are much the same, but the shop fronts have changed. John, who's at the bottom of the picture on the left, is uh, the first person that talked to me when I went up those stairs. John Stevens, he also went on to be a youth worker. And then on, behind him with a scarf is Matthew. And I heard Matthew talking on Radio 2 uh, two or three years ago. He was talking on the Joe Wiley sh show. He was being interviewed by Joe Wiley. And he actually talked about going to the teenage group. He's now Sir Matthew, Sir Matthew Bourne, our most famous ballet chore choreographer. And so some quite a lot of talent came out of 296 Holloway Road. The group ran itself. We had no funding. We were not an official group. We had no paid youth workers. It was run by young people. Quite a remarkable achievement. Regular activities like any other youth group met on Sunday afternoons and also on Wednesday evenings. People came from all over London and further afield. Featured in Gay News in 1977. Some members of the group were willing to have their faces shown. Some even have their full names printed. We had trips to other towns and cities on Saturdays, including Guildford, Cambridge, Norwich, Ipswich, among many others visiting what was usually the only gay pub or gay disco in those towns. Because we were not an official group, we were vulnerable. We were vulnerable to prosecution. Well, the organisers were, people like Steve Power, seriously worried and quite rightly so, that they might be prosecuted for conspiracy to corrupt public morals and to take legal advice on this issue. But there was a chance that we could get registered, so we applied to ILIA and in doing so had to appear before several area youth committee meetings to state the case for a gay teenage group. Of course, no other youth group had to do this. A film, a short film was made to support the application and this has recently been rediscovered. Black and white and grainy, but it's absolutely amazing to see it. There was one gay youth worker who, although unpaid in his role with the group, did provide support, important support, advice, guidance, but also practical assistance, especially driving the minibus. And Chris Hume, that youth worker, also helped to support other gay and lesbian youth workers and set up organisations for them at a time when they were extremely vulnerable could easily be fired, like teachers who came out or, was known as to be, or were known to be gay. By 1978, we had one open gay pop star, Tom Robinson. He appeared on top of the pops, singing 2468 Motorway, and also released a record, believe it or not, Sing If You're Glad To Be Gay. And these were the record sleeves what was important about these record sleeves is that they had the gay switchboard number on the back. And I can tell you that a lot of people ran that number and found out about the gay teenage group or other youth groups as a result of Tom Robinson's record. And we got him to come along to the group, bought his guitar and gave us a little private event. There would have been about 20, 25 people packed into the small rooms above 296 Hollow Road. We needed new premises and Grapevine, who we hired the premises from, then had to move as well. So we were transferred to another organisation's premises in Manor Gardens. At the same time, we continued to seek 
official registration. And this was opposed by many people, of course, including, for example, the National Association of Boys Clubs. But finally, in 1979, the group got the go-ahead to register with ILIA, the Inner London Education Authority. And so gay youth groups could become official. And this was the first. As Gay News reported, after two years of subdued controversy, this set a hopeful precedent for other gay youth groups. And groups were now being formed in Liverpool and Manchester. Registration meant the London Gay Teenage Group could apply for grants and this helped to pay for the hire of the hall that was now being used in Manor Gardens. Some older gay men decided that other gay teenagers around the country needed support and helped to set up the Joint Council for Gay Teenagers. At the time this was set up, there were three groups in, of, in existence for gay teenagers, Leicester, London and Merseyside. But the Joint Council helped others to be established they also lobbied Parliament with young people for things like reducing the age of consent and helped gay young people support each other, networking. This is, of course, well before the age of the Internet. They published this booklet, Breaking the Silence, as well as I Know What I Am. As well as guides, including gay youth groups, how to set one up. On the left, we have some scribbled notes. This is part of Mickey Carpenter's archive in LSE, which I've spent many, many hours reading through. And uh, it's great fun, as well as fascinating. Great fun when you discover yourself in the minutes of a meeting you went to, which you'd forgotten about. So I say, other groups were being set up now in other parts of the country. Two great examples that I found in the archives, Manchester and Southampton. My short, short talk concentrates on the London Gay Teenage Group, but regional local histories of early gay youth groups require to be written. So if you're out there, go ahead. The Joint Council helped set up a gay youth movement. What they wanted to do was hand all this over to young people. But by gay youth, this meant anyone who was under 26. So Whereas the teenage group was just for under 21s, there was a recognition that gay youth could be for early 20s as well. So the gay youth movement basically took over from what the Joint Council was doing. They set up a pen pal scheme, which must have helped many isolated teenagers find support and friendship. They ran summer camps. They achieved visitor status on the British Youth Council. They led delegations to Parliament, but politically they were very extreme and it became so extreme that it was never taken too seriously and has left left legacy. Its support for the paedophile information exchange being its most unfortunate connection. It ceased to exist in about 1988. However, the teenage group, the London Gay Teenage Group, went from strength to strength in March 1982 it had its first paid youth worker, Greg Latchford. Here they are shown at Gay Pride. Like any other youth group, youth club, it was the inevitable game of pool taking place. Political controversy continued. Questions about why ratepayers were funding gay teenagers were always asked. The Greater London Council was a major source of funding and they funded a research project which employed two researchers, Lorraine Trenchard and Hugh Warren, in 1983. And in 1984 and 1985, four publications were produced. Something to tell you is on the left, that's the, the biggest publication, and three supplementary little booklets. These can still be found in many libraries and were widely circulated. The Queen Mother, who was the patron of the Manor Garden Centre where the group, the London Gay Teenage Group met, came to visit the centre in 1988 and the London Gay Teenage Group representatives presented her with a couple of those booklets. 
we're not sure whether she read them, but she was very gay friendly, we believe. Now, I mentioned that we had women and young men at the London Gay Teenage Group, but it was predominantly young men who attended. So it was decided that it should be a, a separate group for young lesbians. And this was actually established in mid-1979, meeting on Monday nights. Lesbians were still most welcome at the London Gay Teenage Group, as were any young people. And uh, in 1982, the young lesbian group as well as the gay teenage group, managed to uh, get funding to employ a part-time youth worker. Young lesbians became particularly active in something called the Lesbian and Gay Youth Video Project, which produced a film called Framed Youth, with Revenge of the Teenage Perverts, which was issued in 1983. Rose Collis, who we heard from earlier today, was involved in that project. These were some of the young lesbian venues that they could visit in London. By the end of the decade, there was a young black lesbian group in London. This photograph, we believe, was taken in 1990, possibly on a trip that they made to the Netherlands. Islington and Camden London councils were the most pro-LGBT, and they helped to set up something called the North London Line, which was to support young people who were LGBT. This included a number of projects, including the Young Lesbian Video and Pizza Evening. But of course, there was increasing concern in the Conservative government about promotion of homosexuality and the availability of gay publications in schools and libraries. The Milkman's On His Way, a novel published in 1982, was brought to the Prime Minister's attention in 1978. Ilya had included it in a recommended reading list for children aged 15 plus. It certainly was graphic in sexual detail, and some of those details were highlighted in this document, which you can see at the bottom of the page, which is a document that's now in the National Archives. And these were the highlights that were brought to the Prime Minister's attention. And this book, along with other evidence, led to Clause 28, which subsequently became Section 28 of the Local Government Act 1988, preventing a local authority from promoting homosexuality. The GLC, which the Conservative Government was not keen on, was abolished in 1986. The Inner London Education Authority followed in 1990. But the 1990s did see some glimmers of hope, Edwina Curry, who was a Conservative, tried to get a bill through Parliament re reducing the age of consent from, 16 to, from uh, 21 to 16. That was rejected, but Parliament did accept lowering it to 18 at that time. And then finally, the Sexual Offences Amendment Act of 2000 reduced the age of consent for gay sex to 16. And that became law on the 8th of January 2001. So this research that I've been doing has been not only fascinating, but also great fun because I've organised a couple of reunions and a lot of older, mainly gay men, but also some uh, trans people have, and lesbians and bisexuals, of which I'm one, have been involved in getting together, recounting their tales, which I've encouraged them to do. Some of those tales are being published in a book that I've written called Courage to Be Organised Gay Youth in England 1967 to 1990. This book is going to be available in the autumn so do look out for it. You'll find there's an awful lot more in it than I've been able to cover in the short talk. I thank you for your attention. And that completes my talk. Lovely, thank you very much Clifford. That was just brilliant. Um, I don't know if there's any questions in the chat. Do you want to stop screen sharing so we can see you? Sorry, yes. <laughs> Thank you very much, yes. <laughs> if your camera comes back, we'll keep our fingers crossed. Um, yeah, anybody wants to post any questions in the chat? Because I, I haven't got any there at the moment. Oh, 
someone they, saying they've all gone the, 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 in the chat someone's just said <laughs> brilliant talk young lesbian and pizza evening sounds amazing yes i quite agree i think i was thinking that too <laughs> um there is a question i think further down sorry i was just need to see where i can um so uh the question is I, so she's saying, I volunteer with some of our LGBTQ plus youth group here in Bedford. Some of our young people's favourite activities are playing a game called Mafia, making memes and doing art projects. Yay. Um, I'm wondering what activities the gay youth groups of the past did just for fun. What did you used to do, Clifford? <laughs> well, I have to say that um, regulations were a lot less severe in my day. And we used to go, you know, we used to have bottle parties and things. There were, there were no forms to fill out uh, for a start. You know, a lot of us went to that group. We didn't tell our parents or parent where we were going. And um, we weren't asked all our details, you know, name, address, telephone number, date of birth. It was quite an informal group. And that was really important. So people felt comfortable about being able to just come along and not being outed or not being having their parents told they're going there. But now, because uh, this youth group I've been involved with doing this history project, it's much more structured and formal, which is partly as a result of the safeguarding regulations that we've got now. So activities are much more sort of um, prescribed, if you like, uh, today. And there's some great activities, but we, we were much wilder, I would say. Of course, we spent a lot of our time just playing records, vinyl, I should say, vinyl, <laughs> seven inch, <laughs> seven inch for those who remember them playing records, chatting, playing pool, uh, maybe doing a bit of artwork. We didn't really have like, any formal structure then. Now, later on in the 1980s, when we had paid youth workers, this is after I've left the group, I'm, I've gone away to university, I'm older now. But later on, when, we had a paid, when the group had a paid youth worker, they introduced um, some discussion groups and education and they had speakers visiting. So that became a bit more organised and slightly more political in, in a way, but it wasn't compulsory. Um, what were the other things we did? We invited people along. I mean, we had Tom Robinson, I said. We also had Wayne County, who was transitioning at the time to Jane County, famous American rock star. And me and my friend Phil, after we met uh, Jane, as she is now, at the teenage group, we went off together with her to a pub. He was a great fan. I've still got the badges. That was great fun. Look, look, Jane County up. Um, yeah, we were a lively bunch. People came and went, you know. There's loads of things you can do. I mean, I, I, I'm involved in this uh, youth group uh, in recent years since I've been involved in this history project. And one of the things I like doing is doing fanzines or zines, they call them now, zines. You know, yeah, they're, they're really popular, aren't you know, they? Yeah, so that's great sort of fun. and Lots of arty type stuff. Yeah. Well, we've been having, I must say, um, while, you're, while you're mentioning badges, I would just say if anybody would like an LGBT History Month badge for our theme, which was Body, Mind and Spirit, they, you can get one from the LGBT plus History Month uk website. So you can, oh, we can hear you typing there, Clifford. Um, oh, sorry. <laughs> that's okay. um, but yeah, you do, yeah, get right on it. So like Clifford, he was bad. Um, and also, thank you, Q Youth. I, I feel sad because we've not been able to do the activities we would have normally have done. <laughs> so, um, oh, what's that? Gary, Gary, oh, I think set that, put that comment in Q&A, if it's the same Gary James. Ah. Gary has published this book and I'm, I'm, unabashedly giving him free publicity for this book <laughs> Spangles Glam and uh, this is uh, all about his time is uh, a program called The Tube and other things you know growing up gay being a being a, a underground driver as well oh. but The Tube was with Jules Holland but anyway Gary was a good friend of Phil Cox and uh, we're both pleased to honour Phil Cox who sadly died as a young man one of the many people who died of an age related or AIDS or AIDS. So there's Gary's book. And the people who are publishing that are the same people, same publisher who's publishing my book. Excellent. Well, thank you so much. 